Um, Mr. Chairman, and ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much for the invitation to take part in this historic uh, hearing on the most significant catastrophe in the history of Poland since World War II. Um, from the point of view of safety and security of international aviation, the key reasons why a new investigation into the Smolensk catastrophe is required are as follows. First, the pilot error scenario was adapted from the outset of the investigation as the only viable hypothesis for the probable cause of the Smolensk crash. Second, the investigation process was distorted due to political pressure to conform uh, to the official version of the pilot error. People with a vested interest in confirming the official version decided on the course and outcome of the investigation. Third, the investigation was conducted in violation of all well-established international standards for the investigation of fatal aircraft accidents. Fourth, the distorted investigation process led to wrong conclusions. Fifth, as a result of massive campaign to accuse the dead, innocent people who died in the crash were unfairly blamed for causing the crash, and the families of the victims were subjected to cruel and inhumane treatment. Finally, safety recommendations issued as a result of such a distorted investigation process are misleading, inadequate, and thus useless. The top Polish, Polish government officials made the political decision not to blame the Russian Federation for the Smolensk crash, as proven by the secret click tapes recorded in April 2010 and made public in December 2011. This strategic decision led to the adoption of the pilot error scenario to the exclusion of all other probable causes of the crash. The strategy to blame the dead served the interest of all parties involved in the Smolensk investigation. As a result of the political consensus to blame those who died in the crash, technical defect and terrorist attack scenarios were ignored. For example, a serious incident involving the failure of the steering system and autopilot during a humanitarian mission flight to Haiti on January 23, 2010, was not even mentioned in the official report. Technical defects reported after the general overhaul performed in Samara, Russia, in December of 2009, were not addressed in the official reports either. Similarly, no explanations as to the cause of the unusually extensive damage to the airplane was provided, and no explanation as to the lack of survivors was made. A request for the air test at the Sivirn Airdrome on the day of the crash was disregarded. An inquiry regarding unidentified activities in the airspace of Sivirn Airdrome on the day of the crash was ignored. Credible terrorist threat alerts reported on the eve of the crash were not considered, and other known threats against the victims of the crash were ignored. Gross violations of well-established international standards for the investigation of the aircraft accidents were committed during the investigation into the Smolensk crash under the auspices of the Interstate Aviation Committee and ICAO authorized investigative body. To grasp with the scale and such violations, it, it is worth highlighting the most apparent ones. The key evidence was not properly secured, identified, documented, and preserved. A methodology used for evidence identification was not defined. A chain of custody for the key evidence was not preserved. The wreckage of the plane was subjected to destruction the next day. The crash site was not properly secured. Valuable personal belongings of the victims were stolen. In six days, the crash site was transferred to the administration of Smolensk for sanitary disposal. The area was cleaned up and regraded. Trees were cut down.
No detailed records of rescue operations were made available. The treatment of the bodies violated the dignity of the victims and traumatized the families. The medical examination of the bodies was inappropriate. Postmortem reports were grossly inaccurate and wrong. Numerous instances of manipulation of evidence were documented. Certain pieces of debris were moved and their new locations was reported as the original position. M many parts of the aircraft went missing. Witness testimonies were changed. Important statements from the cockpit voice recorder were disregarded while non-existent statements were used in the report. Inconvenient TAUS readings were omitted. The key data from the flight data recorder was either not provided or presented in unreadable format. Essential reports, including a detailed survey of the crash site and toxicological analysis of the remains, were not provided. The official reports disregarded the Polish objections to the Russians' conclusions, as well as 80% of Polish inquiries submitted uh, by the Polish expert team. The official reports were issued despite the fact that the Polish investigators, investigators were denied adequate access to the black boxes and the wreckage of the plane. The official reports did not consider data from electronic devices belonging to the top Polish officials who died in the crash. Similarly, the reports were issued without full consideration of a complete set of satellite pictures as well as the video recording from the Sevierny airdrome. Um, information was withheld, thus not considered in the official reports. The Russian report evades many important issues, including the role of the air navigation system, performance of the air traffic control group, and the analysis of the airplane incident history. Accordingly, no safety recommendations are made with respect to those omitted or downplayed issues. The report includes many contradictions, in particular with respect to aeronautic maps and charts, the course and glide path of the aircraft, the work of the land zone controller. The psycho-emotional analysis of the pilots is overemphasized, while the technical analysis of the flight uh, uh, final stage uh, is de-emphasized. The key sections of the report that describe the final moments of the flight is wrong. The description of the final stage of the flight is based on speculations not properly verified by scientific methods. False statements allegedly obtained from the cockpit's voice recorder are aimed at discrediting the late president of Poland, the commander-in-chief of the Polish Air Force, and the Polish military pilots. The subsequent expert analysis of the CVR or, or cockpit voice recorder proved that these alleged incriminating statements were never made. Um, I would like to um, very briefly, quickly uh, introduce to you the final conclusion of the Russian report and uh, the so-called, uh, there are four components of the immediate cause of the crash that are uh, listed in the official final conclusion of the Russian report. As you, as you see, I broke them into four uh, issues, and I will um, basically um, I will demonstrate now that as of the day of this hearing, all the above factors allegedly contributing to the immediate cause of the crash have been uh, challenged, invalidated, and proven false. Uh, with respect to the first allegation, the crew shall not be blamed for not making a timely decision to proceed to an alternate airport in light of the um, following reading of the air traffic control is, uh, can be considered wrong. Uh, one hour before the crash, a colonel, Russian colonel Krasnokutsky stated, a trial approach they, they will make without a discussion to their minimum. And then 15 minutes before the crash, the colonel Krasnokutsky says, Paul, uh, he, uh, he says it to the chief air traffic controller, Paul, you will lead to 100 meters, 100 meters and no discussion. Clearly, the Polish pilot should not be blamed for m making a trial approach in light of Colonel Klasnoskutski explicit decision to bring the Polish Air Force One down to 100 meters. Colonel Klasnoskutski exerted pressure on the chief air traffic controller, Plusnin, 
to clear flight 101 of the Polish governmental plane to 100 meters. Colonel Krasnokutski was an unauthorized third person at the air traffic control tower. A Polish inquiry as to the role of Colonel Krasnokutski at the air traffic control tower during landing of the Polish Air Force One remains unanswered. Second allegation that the crew undertook descent without visual contact with ground references to an altitude much lower than the minimum um, is also wrong. As you see a fragment of the transcript, uh, this transcript uh, rebuts the allegation that the Polish pilot in command descended to an altitude lower than minimum in order to establish visual flight. The reading of the cockpit voice recorder clearly demonstrates the decision to go around made at the proper minimum altitude and contradicts allegations of an intent to establish visual flight below the minimum descent altitude. The third allegation of, dis um, of disregarding Tau's warning is also wrong. The pilot could justifiably disregard those warnings since small and severity was not in the database. Hence, erroneous warning could have been expected. However, according to the cockpit voice recorder, the crew of the Polish Air Force One did not ignore Tau's warning. The first such warning sounded one second after the air traffic controller proclaimed, you are two on course on glide path. Within a few seconds from that first, the first warning, the second pilot announced the decision altitude is reached. The navigator confirmed the decision altitude and the pilot in command issued an order to go around. Thus, the pilot in command did not ignore the warning. To the contrary, he made an immediate decision to go around. His decision was timely and appropriate. However, for a reason that remains unknown to this day, the airplane, instead of going around, experienced an accelerated descent. Fourth allegation of psychological pressure to land at any means exerted on the pilot in command by the commander in chief of the Polish Air Force is not only wrong, but is also deeply offensive to the families of the victims, to the Polish armed forces, and to the Polish people. According to the official reading of the transcript, the commander in chief was not present in the cockpit. There is no evidence of any psychological pressure on the pilot in command, and cockpit's voice record their evidence contradicts any allegation or any intention of landing at any means. The above three factors will be addressed. It has been established beyond a reasonable doubt that the commander-in-chief of the Polish Air Force was not in the cockpit. General Blasik voice was not identified on the cockpit voice recorder. His body was found with 12 other bodies and away from the bodies of the pilot and cockpit debris. Those findings in validate the allegation that General Blasik was in the cockpit at the time of the impact with the ground. Furthermore, this, it has been established that the key statement, 100 meters, originally assigned to General Blasik, was made by second pilot. Accordingly, the allegation that the pilots did not monitor the altitude properly is also wrong. There is no evidence that General Blasik exerted any pressure on the pilot to land. General Blasik was not present in the cockpit, and there is no evidence of any conversation or exchange between the pilots and General Blasik during the flight. Furthermore, there is no evidence of any psychological pressure exerted by the President Lech Kaczynski on the Polish pilots to land at any cost. The allegation, the Russian report makes several references to a statement, quote, he will go crazy, alleged, allegedly made by the pilots during the flight as a proof of undue pressure exerted on the pilots by President Lech Kaczynski. However, according to the reading of the cockpit voice recorder, the pilots never made such statements. Contrary to the Russian report, there is no evidence whatsoever that the pilots feared a negative reaction of the main passenger. The reading of the cockpit voice recorder refutes any allegation and changes of psycho uh, and charges of psychological pressure exerted on the pilots by their superiors to land at any cost. 
the only communication between the pilot in command and the passenger regarding landing took place with the director of protocol 15 minutes before the crash, uh, and the pilot in command stated, Mr. Director, fog came out at this moment. In these circumstances that we have right now, we will not be able to land. We'll try to make an approach, but most likely nothing will come out of it. So please start thinking about a decision what to do next. The above statements represent the key evidence of the state of mind of the pilot in command soon before the crash with respect to landing. His state of mind as evidenced by his statements directly contradicts the allegation that he was determined to land at any means. In fact, the above statements uh, demonstrate competent and professional conduct of the pilot in command. In conclusion, the pilot decision to request a trial approach to a minimum descent altitude was legal and appropriate. The pilot decision to go around made at the minimum descent altitude was timely and appropriate. The pilot relied on correct altitude and there is no evidence of any psychological pressure exerted on the pilot in command by his superior, superiors to land at all cost. Accordingly, the official pilot error conclusion is wrong, thus safety recommendations issued pursuant to the wrong conclusion are useless. Thank you.